Hey, Michelle. No, I'm well, no, no, no. That's why I don't like going home. It's not good for my health physically or psychologically. That's for sure. It was a very long three days. Let me tell you very, very long three days. Nearly killed me being back there. Hey, Nick. Give people a minute to jump on here. I'm going to go through a few things that are very important for the everyday dog owner. Mm -hmm. Early morning. I got to get it done. Busy today. Have a lot of catching up to do on things. Hey, Alicia, good morning. Good morning. I hope everyone's, I'm all messed up with the days because of the holiday. I never know what day it is anymore. I know this is an odd time for me. I never do this. Hey, Jennifer. Hello, Judy. Mm -hmm. Very odd time. But I promised someone I would. And if I don't do it now, I will not get it done. Hello, Annette. Yeah, it's unfortunately, it's pretty common, Annette. Um, don't forget, guys, tomorrow evening is the live with uh, Haz from Shield K9. I, I think that's going to be a very, very good live. I know people are looking forward to that. What's up, Natasha? How are you? Pinchow. Hope I say that right. Hey, what's up, Nathan? I didn't realize that was you when I passed you the other day till I was getting by you up the street from my house. Mm-hmm. Get this done and then go out and start the day. Well, my day started very early, as usual. As usual. But again, 7 p.m. Central for the for the live tomorrow. Okay. All righty. All right. I'm not going to take much more time because I keep these up. So anyone who needs to see it can. What is that glare? Where is that coming from? You guys see that? What is that? Hmm. It's kind of annoying. I don't know what that is. All righty. I don't let me see if I can change this here. Ah, all right, that's better. Yeah, it is. What's up, Phil? Hello, Amanda. Don't any of you folks work? Is everyone retired? What's going on with that? Okay, a couple of things that I've had to deal with a lot lately. And I'm helping people on the side and a lot of questions. Very, very simple, basic stuff. But again, the basic stuff is where people are failing miserably. I mean, failing, failing, failing miserably. Okay. Um, Let's get into, real quick, I'm going to go over this. Let's get into a seminar cheat code, all right? What do I mean by that? The people that come to our seminars, or any seminar, they're always so stressed and so worried. And uh, and the reason they're stressed and worried is because most aren't prepared and they have problems, right? So I'm going to go through this super, super fast, but it does pertain to all dog owners, the everyday dog owner. So if you're a trainer on here right now, and a lot of you are trainers, it may not be of so much interest to you, but it's where, in my opinion, the real success and the real failures come from, right? So let's say we have someone, they bring a dog out to, you know, work with us at a seminar. I'm out there waiting for the person and we ask questions. We ask what the problem is. We're there all, all the same old stuff, right? Um, Good deal, Greg. Glad to hear that. One of the issues, the most common things we see is no one has any kind of dialogue, no communication, no set markers with their dog, right? So there's absolutely zero communication between the owner and the dog. And this is something that the everyday dog owner really, really struggles with. Even once you start teaching them and working with them, it takes a very, very long time for it to sink in and for it to make sense and for it to be effective. 
Believe me when I tell you, I know because I push this stuff on the people I work with so hard and I have to talk to them constantly. And sometimes it takes quite a bit of time before the light bulb goes off and things start making sense because the everyday dog owner, they want to love on their puppy or their dog. They want to coddle them. They want to enjoy them, but they don't want to learn how the dog learns. They don't want to learn what the dog understands, what makes sense to the dog. They just don't want to do it. Right. So they have that dialogue to where they talk to a puppy or a dog like the dog understands what they're saying. They don't understand. The human doesn't understand that it's just useless noises coming out of our mouth unless there's something that the dog can associate it with. Right. So when someone comes out and Jay is very, very good about breaking this down at the seminar because he has a very, very set system that he talks about in his own way that makes it very, very clear to people and it makes them think, right? I do things a lot more informal and simple, but it's all the same stuff. And we go over this constantly, right? So when I ask someone, okay, what is, what is the word you use that allows your dog to understand you're about to do something? You're going to start playing. You're about to start training. You're about to do something. What is that word? Very rarely is there a marker for that, right? Like, hey, Byron, hey, Terry, like for me, if I'm going to work Dante, if we're going to just play ball, if we're going to train anything, just like a lot of people, I say, you ready? That activates him. That fires him up. That lets him know we're about to do something. Okay. Then I go grab whatever I'm utilizing at that point. Okay. So even people that have a marker to activate the dog in place, a lot of time what they'll do is let's say you're going to throw a ball with the chuck it for your dog. They'll go, they'll grab the chuck it, and then they say, you ready? It's too late. You already gave the signal to the dog. That's what's happened when you went and grabbed the chuck it. So now that word becomes pretty meaningless. You didn't utilize it in a way that makes sense to the dog, okay? Verbal first, verbal first, verbal first. We can't say that enough, okay? That's not the end of the world. But of course, the big thing is reward markers. There are people that actually don't have a reward mar reward marker. Again, we're talking about the everyday dog owner. That's who you as the dog trainer should be focusing your time on, right? Now, let's make believe they do have a reward marker, which a lot of people tell me they do. So when people send me videos before I'm doing a, a video consultation or a private lesson, whatever, I like to see videos and I tell them, send me a video of you working your dog, just basic obedience, on leash, off leash, I don't care, using food, marking behaviors. Um, let me see a video of you playing with your dog and let me see a video of the problem. A couple minutes each video, right? What I will see 100% of the time, 100% of the time, no exaggeration, is the human with the dog 100% accommodating what the dog does, what the dog wants, never the other way around. The dog goes there, the human goes there. Then the human has a lot of vocabulary where they're saying so many things to the dog. They change the tone of their voice. They'll add the baby talk. They have a full-blown conversation with the dog to think to sounds coming out of your mouth that make absolutely zero sense to the animal. And then when the dog does something you don't like, you get upset, right? So I'll watch someone work their dog. They'll send me a video of them doing obedience and the dog will do something and they'll say, yes, yes. They go right into the porn yeses. Oh my God. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Right to pornographic yeses. They continue. They mark a behavior. Yes. They mark a behavior, yes, and then I see them give them a piece of food. And I'll watch this for two, three, four minutes, and I'll say, okay, what's your reward marker? And they'll say, yes. And I'll say, no, it's not. And they'll go, yeah, it's yes. I'm like, no, it's not. Okay, now stand next to your dog, say yes, like you would mark it, and do nothing. And they do it. They'll say yes. And the dog doesn't even look at them. You know why? I just watched a four-minute video where you mark the behavior with your reward marker, whether it's a clicker or yes, you probably use that reward marker 10 times and 
you may have given a reward once, and that was before you marked it. That's not a reward marker. That makes no sense to the dog, right? So we get excited. Again, we go right into pornographic talk. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, yes, you did it, <laughs> right? Makes no sense. The dog don't give a shit how excited you are. All the dog cares about is when you make a noise out of your mouth, that's what a word is to a dog. It's just a sound. The only way they could associate what that means is what immediately follows after that sound, after that word. So if yes is going to be your reward marker, well, shit, something good better follow to the dog. Not saying you can't miss every now and then, right? But if you're constantly using a reward marker and nothing happens, there is no excitement for the dog, right? So why is it that when we start, let's say, working on the recall, I don't care what you're using, the dog's on a long line, you call the dog, why is it I want that behavior marked the second the dog turns to come your way? Not halfway to you, not when it gets to you. Think about that. Why is it I want it marked as soon as the dog shows intention to come to you? Because if that reward marker has true meaning to the dog, when that dog turns, if he's coming at four miles an hour, when he hears yes, he should be coming at eight miles an hour. He should be coming with everything he has because you marking that intention, the minute that dog turns, when that dog truly understands that reward marker, that should build that dog flying to you, should become flying to you, right? But you're not consistent with it. And of course, it's the same thing with the no. Most middle dog, most dogs in an average everyday household think their middle name is no, right? No, no, no. All day long. No, I said no. What did I tell you? What did we talk about yesterday? Why would you do that when you know better? And the dog's going, what the hell is this lady saying? Like these words that come out of her mouth make no sense to me because she has never showed me anything. So the average dog owner shows their dog nothing, okay? Shows their dog nothing. So yes has to have meaning. No has to have meaning. How does no have meaning? Something has to follow it that makes sense to the dog. That's it, right? Now, when I'm done playing, if I use you ready to go out and start training or playing, well, I also have the signal that shows everything's done. You know what that is? It's very complicated. All done. So if I have all four dogs outside and I'm throwing the ball with the chuck it, they're hyped up. They're fired up. When I say all done, they don't ask there and try to get me to throw it again. They've been conditioned to know that when I say all done, game's over. There is no chance of me throwing it again. And so as soon as I say all done, they all stop and they run back to go into the yard. Every single time in sync, right? I'll ask the people who come out, what's your release command? Uh, well, sometimes I say, okay, sometimes I do this. Some no. No, 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 no. You're not being fair to the dog. If the dog doesn't know when it's free to be a dog and do what it wants, how is a dog to know when it is to remain in command? So you folks that come out to the seminars and you're stressed, you have a couple of weeks to where you could work on this stuff. Make the language very consistent. Very consistent. Very, very consistent. When I say, what gets your dog going? And you say, you ready? Okay, we're going to be able to see what's your reward marker, right? What's your no marker? What's your interruption? How do you end the game? All these things, guys. What you don't understand is when you put these words with a meaning, your communication with your dog gets that much easier. That much easier. I'll jump off of that now. Now, let's talk about a big one, correcting puppies. Ooh, this is a big one. How dare you would ever talk about correcting a puppy? How dare you would ever use any type of aversive on a puppy? An eight-week-old puppy, a 10-week-old puppy, are you kidding me? Well, let's talk about this. 
<clears throat> people tend to never want to correct a puppy for behaviors that should be corrected now. But they'll be very quick to correct a puppy for things that was totally the human's fault and should not be correcting a puppy for, right? I'll give you an example. You have an eight-week-old puppy. You're sitting down watching TV. The puppy's running around. It runs in the next room. It takes a big, hot, hairy poop on your foreign rug, your imported Japanese rug, right, that you spent a ton of money for. You flip out. You're yelling at the puppy. You're telling it, no, no, no. What did you do? What did you do? Some people still believe in taking the puppy's face or nose and rubbing it in the pee or poop. A lot of people have no problem doing that. You cannot correct a puppy for something it has absolutely no control over that you should have 1%, 100% control over. Okay. I, leaving a puppy, giving a puppy too much freedom inside your home, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, I don't care what it is, without keeping an eye on them, is the equivalent of you leaving your three-year-old toddler at home alone and you going to work and your toddler having free range of the house and access to everything and you think everything's going to be okay. It makes no sense. They're, they don't know any different. A puppy is an infant. It's a baby. It knows nothing. It can't even listen to your direction for the most part, right? If your puppy is chewing your sock, it's your fault. You allowed it to get to the sock. If your puppy is chewing the leg on your table, it's not the puppy's fault. It's your fault. You allowed it to get to the, the leg on the table. Do you understand what I'm saying? So giving that puppy too much freedom and then when the puppy does things, you want to scold and punish the puppy for that. That's really difficult to do because that's not the puppy's fault. That is your fault, 100%, right? Now, you put the puppy on a leash and you take it for a walk. And I literally get these calls, eight weeks old, 10 weeks old, 12 weeks old. My puppy is pulling and he won't walk nicely next to me so I could do a structured walk. And the more I pull, the more he pulls. What do I do? I'm like, guys, you have a puppy. Put the puppy on a flexi lead and let the puppy be a puppy. You don't need to walk your dog nicely. Let the puppy explore and see the world at the end of a flexi lead. This way it's not tangled up. He can come back to you. Let him be a puppy. Let him explore. Just walk and let the puppy be a puppy. We're not trying to teach the puppy how to walk nicely at eight weeks old or 12 weeks old. We don't care. Let it explore. And every time that puppy turns and comes your way, mark that and then reward. Guess what the puppy starts to realize? Ooh, when I check in, good things happen. But again, if that reward marker isn't built in and conditioned early, then you're behind. Let the puppy be a puppy. Okay. Stop worrying about the things that the puppy doesn't have control of. You're going to try to force a puppy to walk nicely. All you're doing is starting off with a ton of conflict and always telling your puppy it's wrong. Just let it be a puppy and explore. All right. Now, when should you correct a puppy? I'll give you an example. I had my first Rottweiler at seven weeks old was vicious. And I'm not exaggerating. At seven weeks old, this puppy was vicious. I was the only one who could touch it. If Stephanie, we didn't have kids yet. If Stephanie tried to touch that puppy, he would go at her with everything he had. A little Rottweiler, seven weeks old, right? I remember taking that puppy to the vet and I told my vet, hey, be careful. Like this is this is a mean little puppy. Like he's got some serious aggression. And the, the vet just laughed. Oh, it's cute. Okay. He went to handle that puppy. He paid the price because he didn't listen to me, right? He couldn't believe it. He's like, this is going to be a problem, you know? And to which I said, well, it's, it's, it's a problem right now, but it will be fixed. I will fix this, okay? It's not going to happen. See, the problem was the puppy never did it with me. I was the only one that could handle this puppy. So I had to have Stephanie deal with that immediately. 
immediately. The problem with this puppy was when you take a puppy home, seven weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, I don't care what it is. That puppy has already received plenty of aversive corrections from its siblings, from its mama. Comes built in. Mother nature doesn't lie, right? When that puppy is too rough with a sibling, that sibling's going to yell, maybe bite back. There's going to be some kind of penalty to pay. If that puppy's hungry and mama is tired and don't want to be bothered, and he goes to nibble on her, she may give him a little growl, maybe even push him away. He comes back. She's going to nail him. She's going to punish that noncompliance. And she's going to do it quickly and harshly. And it may sound terrible. It may look terrible, but she knows what she's doing. She's telling that puppy, what I say goes. And when you do dumb shit, shitty things are going to happen, right? So there's certain things that you have to put an end to now because, listen, puppies bite. They chew things. That's normal. When a puppy grabs your hand, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when a puppy has intent is really causing damage. There has to be repercussions for that, right? So with Stephanie, I made her, who, who's a very, very gentle woman, right? And the last thing you think she'd want to do is correct the puppy. But no has to have meaning. So the second that puppy would try to nail her, I'd make her say no and then grab the scruff a little bit, give it a quick little pinch to where it, it, it would definitely make the puppy not like it, right? And then I had to have her take that puppy and hold it down on its side. I don't tell people to alpha roll their dogs, right? But we're talking a puppy here. And that puppy would fight her. And I would say every time he does this to you, 100% of the times, because I'm, I'm working a lot. I'm a border patrol agent at the time. I'm never home. She has to handle this puppy. Is that every time this puppy does that, you have to go through this. You have to say no, punish that behavior with the, now remember guys, you have to adjust what you're doing according to the puppy or the dog in front of you. So when people think of, you know, punishing a puppy, they think like the worst. Oh my God. No, you have to use common sense. What is appropriate for that dog? Because you have to remember, you're not raising a puppy, you're raising a dog. And what that seven-week-old Rottweiler is doing right now will get him killed when he's seven months old. 100% of the time. Because he's going to hurt somebody really bad. Really bad. When he's nine months, 11 months, 18 months, if he makes it that long, you're done. Now you have a dog you can't handle, right? Right? So now let's say you take that puppy, any puppy, and it goes through its whole puppyhood, its whole adolescence, and never receives any type of correction. It was built in getting corrected from mama and siblings. Now it goes all these months with no aversion to anything. And now all of a sudden you decide you're going to correct this dog when he's an older adolescent becoming an adult, 18 months old. It's not going to work out very well for you, right? With this puppy, this Rottweiler, it was the only puppy in the litter. It had no guidance from its siblings. It was the only single puppy in the litter. Mom and dad were not kind dogs, not friendly dogs, right? This was a straight up backyard breeder with dangerous dogs. I didn't care. I wanted a Rottweiler, right? And I didn't know everything back then. I was just learning. Stephanie had to do that every time. You know what happened to that puppy? You think she broke that puppy? Do you think that puppy hated her? Do you think that puppy stayed away from her? Very quickly, that was mama's dog. That was mama's dog 100% and they were inseparable. So the whole reason I got into Rottweilers, and I don't talk about this much, I don't know if I've ever said it, I used to work a lot of nights in the Border Patrol out in Arizona. We were in a very, very dangerous area. The home invasions were brutal down there. So you'd have someone come into your home and not just rob you. They do horrific things. And so I used to be scared to death leaving Stephanie home alone. 
That's what got us into Rottweilers. That's why I got my first Rottweiler. Okay. Very quickly, that puppy became mama's dog. He absolutely adored her. That was her dog. They were inseparable. You never had to worry about anything. He loved his mama. Why? He didn't maybe have the best education growing up because of the lack of siblings. And the mama didn't really bother too much with him either. So he lived in a backyard in a very dirty yard in sandy dirt and didn't have a lot of guidance. No one ever showed that puppy at four weeks old, five weeks old, six weeks old. What is acceptable? Okay. Never showed anybody. No one showed him. Mama, Stephanie, my wife, was the first one that said, you can't do this and it's unacceptable. So when she would say no and grab him by the scruff and give him a little pinch and then hold him on his side, he would fight and show his teeth and try to get her and she would just stay calm until he would quit. And when he would quit, he would go. <sighs> and then she would let him up. We good. And within no time, very quickly, he realized this is a bad bitch right here. I think I'm going to hang out with her. But she taught that puppy 100%. So that is the appropriate time that you should be correcting the puppy. Not when he poops on your rug. Not when he chews on your wooden leg on your kitchen table. Not when he pees in your shoe. All of those things are things you can't correct the puppy for. You correct yourself for Smack yourself in the face every time your puppy does something like that because you created that. Okay. If that puppy takes a big hot dump in your expensive shoe, smack yourself in the face and then hit yourself in the head with that shoe and get poo on yourself. That's your punishment because that's your fault, not the puppy's fault. All right. I'll get off of that. Now, let's talk about walking your dog as basic as it gets, right? I'm a big fan of the walk, a proper walk, huge fan, big believer in it. I know a lot of people aren't, especially when it comes to because of the sport world people and, and working dog people. It's just not a thing to them. I'm a huge believer in it. Always have been and trained my dogs like that for a very long time and difficult dogs, right? Unfortunately, most people should not be walking their dogs, should not be walking them. And I watch every day just down my own street. I watch every day down my own street. If you can walk your dog properly in a way that it benefits both of you, it's a tremendous experience and a tremendous training experience. Okay. But when I watch someone walk down my street and they're 15 feet behind their dog and the dog's going there, sniffing, peeing, going there, sniffing, peeing, then running back, he's going to poop over here. And you're just following, picking up his poop. You're carrying around the bag. I'm watching these people the whole time they're out with their dog. That dog's ass is facing the human. And that dog is saying, hey, kiss my ass and then follow me wherever I go. And I will tell you when we're going to go home. That's what the majority of people do when they walk their dog. If you can't walk your dog without it pulling you down the street and you continue to do so, you're training your dog to do that and you're rewarding that behavior. Makes no sense to take your dog for a walk. If you can't walk your dog without your dog blowing up when it sees another dog or another human, you should not be walking your dog. You're training your dog to get worse and you're rewarding that behavior. Fix that shit at home. Focus on the basics. Okay. Focus on the basics. And I realized this the other day when people mentioned to me, they didn't even think about the sniffing stuff, right? If you can't put your dog with you and just go for a nice walk without that dog's nose on the ground, now that dog is in hunt mode. Now it's hunting and it's doing what dogs are meant to do, right? 100%. But if you can't say, hey, now you just got to be with me. Let's enjoy this together. Remember the other day I compared play and walking? To me, it's the same thing. When we utilize play to the highest level, to where the dog is crazy about it, right? 
And when he gets that tug, he's not running away with it. He's punching it back in your chest. Why is that? Because you are doing your best to accommodate the dog and be like a dog as much as you can to give that dog what genetically they have to do. You're doing your best to be so much like a dog, right? And it's not always easy and it takes a lot of practice and you have to do it forever before you really get good at it to where the dog's like, this is amazing. I don't want to go over there with the toy. I want to keep playing with you. That's our attempt on being the dog. Now, when we go for a walk, most dogs don't want to walk real slow at your side. They want to explore, right? That's what they want to do. That what comes natural. But now this is the opportunity for the dog to say, you know what? I'd love to be running around free, but I understand why we're doing this. I'm going to be right here at your side and we're going to explore together, right? I don't need the dog looking at me. I don't care if the dog's looking at other dogs and look at, I want him to look at everything except me. I don't want the dog looking at me on a walk. I want the dog taking it in and benefiting from what I am, right? Now, when I get to a place that I want the dog to be a dog, then I'm going to sit him or just stand there and I'm going to release him, free dog. Again, important to have a release command. Hey, go be a dog, buddy. Go ahead. Go sniff on everything. Pee wherever you want. Poop as much as you want. Go eat the rabbit poop. Go jump in the water. I don't give a dog. You are free to be a dog. They have to have that opportunity. Okay? But now when it's time to get going, come on, pal. Let's go. I Most of the time, I don't say anything. I just go. So I'm not technically even putting the dog in a command. If I have to, I'll tell my dogs to walk. I don't tell them to heal because heal is fancy healing. Let's go walk. And then we go for a walk, right? Now it's back with me. We get someplace else, free dog, go be a dog, do your thing. But it's all under my control. Even though we're both enjoying it and we're both getting the benefit, we are a team. We are a team. We want to be a team through everything, but make no mistake about it. I am the captain of that team because guys, if you can't do these simple things, and again, this goes to the everyday dog owner, the millions and millions of dogs that are being failed by owners and fraudulent trainers every single day because the trainer focuses on the dog and they don't focus on the education of the human. They just don't do it. And even when they do focus on the education of the human, they don't understand how much time you have to put into that human. It's not an hour go home lesson. It's not a three hour go home lesson. It's not one lesson. The human needs repetitions over time, just like the dog needs. The human has to fail and make mistakes so you could show them the right way, just like the dog needs to fail and make mistakes so you could show them the right way. But to this day and age, 2022, the amount of trainers that are actually providing proper education for the owner, it's in the single digit percentage. I promise you. I promise you. Right. I talk to people that go to seminars all over the world, talk to them all the time. We see them in our seminars and they'll say it was amazing. So and so was amazing. All right. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. And then we'll get to something that I knew they were taught. Show me, all right, what did you do? And how did they address this issue? And they can't, they can't tell me, they can't show me. In reality, the seminars were very entertaining. They had a great time. They got to socialize. They got to hang out with a big name trainer and they were very entertained. But when they went home immediately, there was nothing they gained. Absolutely nothing. Why is that? Why? Because the trainer wants to handle the issue with the dog. And a seminar is not an ideal place to train a dog. In fact, it it sucks. It's the worst place to train a dog, right? The trainer often wants to look good, so give quick results. But there's no focus on giving something to the people to take away and go home and actually utilize to become better. Actually utilize to become better. 
it's far and few in between. And I know because I've focused all these years on talking to person after person after person. What did you like about this person? What didn't you like? What did you learn? Because I have to be better. I have to be better, right? I have to be better. So guess what? When I do these seminars with Jay and Joel, I don't just get up and leave the whole time they're going so I can go for a run or go to the gym or go get something to eat. I watch a ton of what they do. Very often, all of what they do. Because I'm going to take something little off of each one of them every time I'm with them. Because they're very, very good at what they do. Absolutely fantastic, right? So let's say when when Joel is doing something, a lot of people that came to work with me if they have a problem or came to work with Jay because they want to bring out the best in their dog, a lot of people think what Joel is doing doesn't pertain to them. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. What Joel is doing is teaching behaviors to dogs that everyone should know. He's worked with killer whales. He's taught giant mammals how to do things. He's been very successful in Hollywood for longer than most people on here have been alive. He has to teach dogs how to do behaviors in very difficult situations on a sound stage with tons of lights and people and cameras and the dogs have to nail it all the time, right? So does Joel come out and try to be sexy and exciting and try to do things to entertain the crowd? No, and Joel could be a very sexy man. I've seen it, believe me when I tell you. He's coming to teach you how he teaches these behaviors that you see dogs do in movies that you see dogs doing commercials, right? Really, really important. When you watch Jay work with dogs, and this isn't a promotion for our seminars, we don't need it, right? Because the seminar is doing really well for a reason. Because each one of us truly tries to give people something that when they leave there, they're going to be able to actually utilize. Look, guys, we've had dogs that have been struggling for five, six, some nine, 10 years. Seminar is not the play, best place to fix that, but a lot of those folks leave with those problems fixed, right? When Jay comes out and starts with a PowerPoint, does Jay look like a PowerPoint guy to you? No, he doesn't. But it's so important that stuff he's going to go over and he teaches it in a way that makes it very palatable to people to consume because later on, when he's asking you to do things or I'm asking you to do things, it's going to be very, very important for you to understand this stuff. And so all the, the language and the communication I talked about earlier, Jay has a great way of teaching it very, very clearly for people, right? When he talks about his windows, he didn't invent nothing that he's talking about. He'll be the first to tell you that. What he did was to put it in a way that makes it very easy for people to understand. He's a brilliant teacher. So each one of those guys is going to give you something that you could take away from there, right? Every single dog trainer should, should know how to teach a train retrieve. Most don't. When I first met Joel at the academy and I watched him train the retrieve, I liked the way he did it. Was I doing it much different? Not very, but you know what I was doing different? The way I was literally interacting with the dog, right? When you see Joel take things down and he does that very um, like creeper stalker, like whispering and stuff in his movements, it's very effective on teaching behaviors like that. So all those little things matter, okay? So when we get back to that walk, there's every seminar I wind up taking people outside at night that can't walk their dog, right? There was one person, I forget where we were, I think California. We didn't get to that and we have to do that outside. So literally after seminar was over, everybody was leaving. I was getting ready to leave. I said, let's go outside real quick. This dog's never walked nice on a leash. You know how long that took? It took 10 minutes. It took 10 minutes to teach the dog how to walk nicely. Why? Because it's the easiest thing to teach, pretty much. But the problem is, most people, the dog goes forward and the people pull back. 
creating the dog to want to go forward more. They never show the dog a different picture. I've never had to work with a dog that I couldn't teach how to walk nicely in a few minutes. No prong collars, no e-collars, a leash and a flat collar. That's a 10 minute job. And I've done it every seminar, dozens and dozens of times. Anybody can do it, right? But the problem is me taking someone's dogs and doing it and showing them how easy it is doesn't benefit them. Because although it is very easy, when that dog owner tries to do it, it doesn't make sense to them because it goes against the way the human thinks. Just like the timing of everything goes away against the way the human thinks. The human wants to do everything at the same time or doing the physical over and before the verbal, which makes no sense to the dog. And that's why there's so much frustration and confusion. So much, right? So when I start these seminars, whether it's by myself or when it's with my two buddies, I tell every single person there the same couple of things. For one, I say everything I'm going to do and say this weekend is just the way I do things. Doesn't mean it's the only way, may not even be the best way. It's just the way I do things. And then my goal for every single person, not just my working spots, every single person is that I can actually provide you something that when you get out of here, will help you and make you actually better. That's it. That's my goal. No bullshit, no entertainment. And and look, our seminars are very entertaining. We have a great time. But there's a reason why they're selling out over a year in advance. Because the three of us are on the same page when it comes to truly teaching people how to change their ways, how to teach the dog, getting them to understand how the dog learns, how the dog sees things, right? But I deal with people every single day that have spent $10,000 on multiple dog trainers and they still can't walk their dog nicely. You know why? Because the popular YouTube trainer put an e-collar on the dog and then they did the, the mobile invisible fence. And every time the dog walked out of that little circle, they were blasting them. There was zero dog training, zero dog training. Or it's the same thing with the prong collar or any tool. The second you put on a tool, when you pay a trainer a ton of money and they put on a tool and all of a sudden your dog's walking nicely and you think, oh, my God, this is the best thing ever. Then the second that tool is gone, you're like, holy shit, my dog's still doing it. You know why? There was no education. The dog learned nothing. And more importantly, the human learned nothing. The human learned nothing. You have to teach the dog, you have to teach the human how to teach the dog how to walk nicely so that in five years from now, when that same owner gets a new dog, they don't have to hire a dog trainer. That should be the goal. That should be the goal, right? But the reason the trainers aren't teaching the human is because they don't know how to do it. Making edited videos with sexy, exciting, fancy music and showing before and afters is a fucking joke. And it's a disgrace to, to, the, to the humans out there that are trying to do the best thing for their animal. Don't show me the before and after. Show me the during, motherfucker. Let me see what you're doing. Show people what you're doing. But you know what the problem is? Most can't show what they're doing. Because they're not doing anything to make it better or they're doing things that would make you puke. And that's just a fact. And people don't like that. So every time I talk about this stuff, a lot of people will unfriend me. Well, sayonara. I'll let new people in that are more like-minded because I'm always going to side with the dog first. I don't give a damn about your feelings. I'm going to side with, with the well-being of the animal every damn time. And I'm not a purely positive trainer. Doesn't mean I can't be heavy-handed if I have to. The problem is you very rarely have to be like that. Very rarely. And if you find yourself being like that every day and you can't get a dog to walk nicely on a leash, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You're in the wrong line of work. You're in the wrong line of work. You got to do something else. You have to find something else to do because eventually the fraud that runs through your veins is going to be exposed. That's all there is to it. Okay, guys.
But those are three things that communication has to be clear and consistent. Correcting puppies, you're correcting for the wrong things, things that you're creating. Walking your dog, if you can't do it nicely, you're wasting your time and you're making it worse. Stay at home, go outside, fix that shit without those distractions around. It takes 10 minutes how to keep a, teach a dog to walk nicely on a leash. I promise you. I promise you. Any dog. I don't care. I had one dog took me 17 minutes once of killing myself. It, it was tough. That's the dog that was here a couple of years ago. I forget her name. That came heavily on the Prozac, right? She was drugged heavily. I got her off the drugs and that dog did kick my butt. That was the hardest dog. I couldn't get her to walk nicely, but 17 minutes. That was a long time for that, that thing I was teaching, right? 17 minutes. Any dog, guys, they do this quickly. They do this easily, okay? So please think about those three things. And guys, just focus on the basics. Focus on the basics. Perfect them. That's what advanced obedience is. Doing the basics under all circumstances. That's it. That's all you need. If your dog will come to you under all circumstances and be still under all circumstances, do you need anything else? Everything else is dessert. But you're trying to teach things before your dog understands the most basic language. And that's an uphill battle always, guys. It's an uphill battle always. Don't hope that the dog is going to do what you want. Make the dog do what you want. But you have to be fair to the dog. And that means what you want the dog to do, you must first show them. You have to show them what to do. And then you have to teach them over and over and over through motivating them. You motivate them to do it. And you make it to where they truly understand it. And then when it is rock solid and you know the dog knows it, then you can make the dog do it. It's that simple. It's that easy. It's basic dog training, okay? All right, guys. I'm retired. I went for a nice little walk with my wife early this morning. Did a little work with Dante. He was a total asshole today, and I should have stopped immediately. And I got so mad at him. And he gets so upset when I get mad at him, but he was such a dick today. Like he was obnoxious. I should not have trained today. I, I didn't train long, but I should have stopped immediately. It was one of those mornings where like this dog's going to just push my buttons, right? Going to just push my buttons. Um, now I'm going to go to the gym. All right. And I hope everyone has a great Wednesday. Tune in tomorrow with Haz from Shield K9. It's going to be a good one. I know it is. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Okay, folks. Assalamu alaikum. Peace.